As a natural beauty, she was considered to be the most beautiful woman in Hollywood. Her life was like a modern day fairy tale. The story of a princess who made her way through life thanks to her beauty, only to see herself locked in the tower of a warlord. She escaped her captivity, conquered Hollywood, and changed the future with her inventions and ideas. She was the inspiration behind Catwoman and Disney Snow White, but much more than that, she invented the technology that would form the basis of today's Wi-Fi, GPS, and Bluetooth communication systems. Today, we will learn about Heidi Lamar. Heidi was born as Hedwig Eva Kiesler in Austria, in Vienna, on the 9th of November 1940. Her father, Emil Kiesler, was a bank director who inspired his only child to look at the world differently. They would go for long walks together and talk about the inner workings of different machines like the printing press or cars. And when Heidi was only five years old, she could be found taking apart her music box and assembling it again just to know how that machine operates. Meanwhile, her mother, Gertrude Kiesler, was a concert pianist and introduced her to arts, placing her at a young age in piano classes and ballet. Both her parents were part of the wealthy Viennese Jewish community and were able to provide Heidi with the best education possible. She attended one of the best schools in Vienna, the Doblinger Middle School, which had Anna Freud, daughter of Sigmund, as a teacher. That's insane! So with this brief overview about her parents, we can see how important they were to the foundations of her character and interests. Heidi's mind and ideas were pretty much ignored, but her beauty was noticed. She had a wild spirit and sometimes she would skip school just to go to beauty contests or to go for auditions for movies or plays taking place at the city. And when she was 16 years old, she was discovered by director Max Heinhardt. She studied acting in Berlin and was in her first small role by 1930 in a movie, in a German movie called Geld auf der Straße or Money on the Street. After that, Max cast her in a play called The Weaker Sex. That's when Heinhard uttered some magic words. He said that she was the most beautiful girl in the world. Heidi enjoyed relative success in Berlin with her movies, but she decided to leave the city in 1932 and many of her Jewish fellow performers were also doing the same since the Nazi party rise to power was imminent. But it was really after her role in the film Ecstasy that her name gained a lot of recognition. Ecstasy was a movie that became a wild success propelled by scandal and controversy. The tale of extramarital sex was considered disturbing by some of the more um, conservative cinema goers. Although nowadays a single shot of a naked girl swimming on a lake doesn't sound like much, for 1930, it was. But anyway, that helped Hades' career as she was now the talk in the European cinema and soon enough she got the lead role in a play about Empress Sisi, an iconic historical figure uh, for the Austrian culture. An Austrian munitions dealer, Fritz Mandel, also known as the Munitions King or Merchant of Death, saw her in this play Sisi and they married in oh. 1933. This was actually the first marriage out of six. Funny enough, her last marriage was with her own divorce lawyer. The marriage with Wendell didn't last long, only four years. During those years of marriage, she enjoyed the riches that this marriage could offer her. However, soon enough, she realized that the gold bracelets were um, heavier than handcuffs. And later she says, and I quote, I had every luxury except freedom. He would make sure that she was always at home, he wouldn't allow her to go to any social events or to meet, uh, to network with people and he would make sure that she was always short on cash so she couldn't go out for shopping or something like that. She once said, I knew very soon that I could never be an actress while I was his wife. 
He was the absolute monarch in his marriage. I was like a doll. I was like a thing, some object of art which had to be guarded and imprisoned, having no mind, no life of its own. So yeah, she was very unhappy in this marriage and he demanded she quit acting and ensured she had no access to movies, celebrities or any contact with her fellow performers. Also, after their honeymoon, he locked her in his own version of Rapunzel's tower, the Villa Feginberg, about 160 kilometers away from Vienna. She was forced to put a smile on her face and play the trophy wife to her husband's Manuel, business partners and friends, some of whom were associated with the Nazi party. She fled to London in 1937, but she took with her a lot of the knowledge that she gained from dinner time conversations with her husband's Mandel friends and business partners about wartime weaponry. In London, she met with Louis Mayer, the co-founder of MGM Studios, and this meeting opened the doors of Hollywood to her. The American audience loved her for her grace, beauty and her accent. Louis also picked a new name for her because Kisla sounded too German. So from now on, she was going to be known as Heidi Lamar. After her role in Ogiers in 1938, she was in the fantasy of millions. Her looks inspired the character design of Snow White and later she would also inspire the design of the first Catwoman. In Hollywood, she met Howard Hughes. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this the surname correctly, so sorry. Now this man was everything. He was a businessman, he was an investor, he was a pilot, he was an engineer, he was a film director and a philanthropist. During his lifetime, he was known kind of like an influencer. He was one of the most financially successful individuals in the entire world. And he brought back the inventor spirit in Haiti. He gave her also a small set of equipment that she could use in her trailer on set. He would take Haiti to his airplane factories and workshops um, and show her how the planes were built and even let her talk to the scientists that were doing everything that was creating new planes. One of Hugh's objectives was to create faster airplanes and Haiti was pretty motivated by that. She was inspired to innovate. She bought books about fishes and birds and looked at the fastest of each of them. And then she created a prototype, a design of a plane, mixing some of the features of these two or three animals that she found that were the fastest ones. And when she showed her design to Hughes, he said, oh my God, you are a genius. In 1940, Lamar met with George and Tayo at a dinner party. And like most of these people, he was also a bunch of stuff you know he was like the composer he was an author and an inventor as well Heidi and george had a lot in common and both of them shared a lot of concerns regarding the war with her past knowledge on munitions and weaponry they both started tinkering together ideas and on how they could help to combat the axis powers Heidi kept creating things, uh, like a tablet that dissolved in water to make a soda, like Coca-Cola. She also invented an anti-aircraft shell with a proximity fuse after the US entered the World War II. But her most significant invention is still to come. She developed an idea building on frequency hopping, a concept originally patented by Nikola Tesla in 1903. Lamar noticed that naval torpedoes were given input for speed, direction and depth, but they were left unguided after launch. So how about creating a technology that could control the trajectory remotely? And even more, how can one prevent the enemy from jamming the signals that were given through radio signals? With the help of her friend Antayo, she created a contraption similar to a piano row that would switch between 88 frequencies and this would make really hard for the enemy to intercept. This system was patented in 1942 under the name of secret communication system. 
It was fully developed by the US military in 1959 to control remotely early models of drones. And three years later, um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, all US Navy vessels were equipped with this technology. The secret communication system became a fundamental component for wireless communication systems like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. This invention was evaluated as worth 30 billion dollars of today's money. And yet, Haiti never saw a single cent of it. The Navy actually rejected the implementation of the system in 1942 and she failed to renew her patent uh, three years later. After her contract with MGM expired, she started producing herself, but things didn't go that well. And also, as I mentioned before, she was married a lot of times and she lost a lot of money just paying for divorces and lawyers of, throughout her whole life. It came to a point that in 1965 she was ruined and she confessed to a fan I have no idea where my next meal is coming from and some days I go hungry. In 1998, she filed her last lawsuit against the software company Coral Corp for using her picture in the cover of Coral Draw without her permission. In her last years, she actually became obsessed with plastic surgery. Some people say that she was attempting to recover the beauty that she lost over time. However, she wrote in her biography, My face has been my misfortune. It has attracted all the wrong people into my boudoir and brought me tragedy and heartache for five decades. My face is a mask I cannot remove. I must always live with it. I curse it. So maybe that's what she was trying to do through plastic surgery. Maybe she was trying to erase that face that distracted the whole world um, from her true talents and from her ideas and from her mind. In her gravestone, we can find the quote, films have a certain place in a certain time period. Technology is forever. But talking about technology, let's see a little bit more how the secret communication system actually worked. This technology was invented with the Navy in mind, since at the time, radio controller torpedoes could be sent off by, uh, of course, by enemies if they were able to intercept them. Through manipulation of radio frequencies, the secret communication system would create an unbreakable code using two motor-driven rows like a piano. One row was installed in the transmitter and another row would be installed in the receptor, in this case in the torpedo. Then they could synchronize between 88 different frequencies, which is the number of keys in a piano. With that, she created the first frequency hopping spread spectrum system. The system would switch frequencies in a pre-programmed pattern and only the transmitter and the receiver know the order of the switches. Without knowing the exact pattern for the frequency hops, the enemy cannot interpret the signal, meaning the system is much more secure. In short, they put a piano player inside a torpedo. This principle was incorporated into Bluetooth and GPS technology and it's similar to methods used in legacy versions of Wi-Fi. Lamar's invention was acknowledged by the Electronic Frontier Foundation in 1997 as a very important development for wireless communications. The work also led to her induction into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2004. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, please like the video if you did and subscribe to the channel to support me. I hope to see you in the next video, bye!